I met Jackie when she was uh, being considered uh, for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. I was one of the judges that year, and she ended up winning that competition in 2010. So she's the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in Health Sciences for 2010. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jackie Butler tonight. Okay, is it the microphone on now? Okay. Um, thank you so much for having me here. It's fun for me to be able to tell you uh, the good and the bad of being an entrepreneur, but it's really exciting to me. I came in and spoke to some of the students earlier, and I'm in awe of all of these students and what you know already and the head start that you already have to be in, able to take entrepreneur classes, to be able to have MBAs and business backgrounds, to have professors here like Dr. Glazer, you, uh, the school has no idea what they've got with him. He is amazing. He comes from the field of being an entrepreneur himself and also the academic background. It is amazing what you have here and the opportunity you have that you can take from these professors. So it, uh, I don't know how, I think uh, they could probably tell you a lot more than I could. When I was, um, your age, stay in a classroom like this and taking lecture series, I can honestly say I never would have dreamed I was going to be here speaking to you guys. I uh, wasn't an ambition. It wasn't anything I ever dreamed of doing. And it is interesting where I've come and where my path has taken me. Being an entrepreneur is one of the most exciting, funnest, scariest things you can ever do in your whole life. But it's also the most rewarding. It you cannot um, possibly imagine the excitement, the um, exhilaration you feel from starting your own company. And I hope that tonight I can excite somebody here to want to do that themselves and to go through with it and see just what kind of a ride you can go on. Sometimes uh, being an entrepreneur, you have the first thing you have to realize is you can't do everything yourself. You start a company and you think, I can do it. And uh, you don't want to let go. You know, I know how to do this. I'm not going to trust anyone else to do it. You have to er learn early on that it takes a lot of people. You have to have really good employees you can trust. You have to have advisors, people that have done this before, that know the things that you don't have the time to catch up to learn. Uh, experts in the field and family members that literally, my, my children grew up, uh, stuffing envelopes or doing flyers or doing things for the company that uh, needed to be done. Sometimes your biggest setbacks are, or the most difficult times of your life turn out to be the best thing that can happen to you because that creates an, a need that you have, that you can go forward with. And it, it takes a lot of courage to be an entrepreneur. But remember, courage is fear hanging on one second longer. That's all it is. You can do it. Um, I really do love being an entrepreneur. I'm passionate about it. I love to teach it. I love to mentor people. And I love to do it myself. Um, it, it's interesting. You're on call all the time. You take home your work. You worry about it all night long and you don't sleep. You um, are constantly busy. But at the same time, it's ex extremely exhilarating. And you're not tied to uh, a paycheck. Sometimes you don't even get a paycheck as an entrepreneur, but you're not tied to one. You can do what you want, and you're whatever you do in your life, you've created yourself. You're not dependent on someone else. Um, when entrepreneurs are free to do what they do best, they're able to change the world. This country was built on entrepreneurs. That's how this company country started. And that's where it needs to go back to. You are the future of this company, country. For new entrepreneurial uh, endeavors that you do will make a difference to the way this country is run. And we're hoping that a lot of you will do that to take the country back to where it really has been, where it needs to be. The best way to predict, predict your future is to create it. And that is... 100% true. If you want to do something and you want to do it in your life, the best way to do it is create it. It's that simple. I became an entrepreneur because of my dad and my grandfather. They were both entrepreneurs. Um, this is a picture of my grandfather and my dad in the early 1900s. 
Um, they both started businesses. Yeah, this was my grandfather's first business. He started a grocery store in the middle of Holiday, Utah. And he did it during uh, the recession. So it was a really difficult time for him, but very educational. And my dad worked there, and, and he learned to be an entrepreneur. So I didn't have the same... I came from a different background than most of you. I just assumed that's what everybody did, that you just started your own business. And it wasn't something that scared me, where some of you that have never done that before, it might you might have a little more fear. You need to just overcome that and and go on with it. I never viewed this as, as a risk in any way. My dad was my best example in life. Um, he taught me how to make sure that I got an education, that that was the very most important thing. And as far as you students here, you're that much farther ahead because business is what need, what you need to have the basis of. You have to have that basis in order to make your company grow. Anyone can have an idea and start it, but if they don't have the business, it will fail. 95% of all businesses are gone within the first five years. But if you have that the idea and the business background, you are cutting your odds tremendously because you have the education that you need to make it work. Um, my dad taught me that uh, I needed to be honest, I had to have integrity, and that I had to do the very best I did in anything. And that has been my motto from the day one when I ever started anything. I did not compromise my integrity or my honesty and that we did the very best we could do in anything we did. I feel that I owe him my success because of what he taught me. And then also you don't want to take unreasonable risks. Make sure that any risk that you do take is very well thought out, that you have researched it, you know what you're doing, and that you're not taking something that's so unreasonable it's not going to work because it needs to be calculated and researched before you go into anything. So do any of you here have what it takes to be on hand? Um, I have many people come to me all the time with wonderful ideas. It, it amazes me the ideas they come up with. It's like, wow, that is fantastic. How do you even think of that? And then they sit on it, and they sit on it until they get mad when someone else takes it and makes it into what they wanted. If you have an idea, you're not going to get anywhere with it unless you do something with it. But you have to have the, um, you have to know, take the idea and do something with it. It'll never happen without. Your dreams are the blueprint of your reality. No one, no, is already the answer if you don't do it. You might as well just forget getting anywhere if you don't take that first step. Now, there are a lot of different ways to be to start a business. There's a lot of entrepreneurial ideas out there, and I can only give you what I have experienced because that's the only thing I, I can uh, draw from. You can take it for what it is, and if it happens to fit what you're looking for or give you any ideas, then I hope you can use it. Um, when I was growing up, my dad had started many companies, and they were all in the startup phases, and he we didn't have a lot of money. So in order for me to go to college, and no one in my family had ever gone to college, I had to get a scholarship. So I was able to get a, a scholarship to BYU, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, I went went to school there. I had enough money and a scholarship to go to three years of college there. So I had to graduate in three years. I had a business minor, but my major was in fashion merchandising, which has a lot to do with what I do now. <laughs> um Education was the first step that, that I took. And when I graduated, at the time I graduated, my dad had just read a book, and it was How to Turn a Thousand Dollars into a Million Doing Real Estate. At that time, that was a lot of money. And he got books on how to do plumbing and roofing and all of the other things that you need to do to fix up rental properties. And I learned alongside of him. So I could do plumbing and electrical and roofing, and I could lay carpet, I could paint, I could do anything. And I decided to go into it with him. And as long as I did it with him, we were, we were un, unbelievably successful. And then I decided to deviate from the plan and decided to go into under conversions and new real estate. And it would have been extremely successful, but the recession came on and I researched it. And most recessions are about three years long. Well, this one lasted seven. And within, by the time I was 25, I'd made my first million. By the time I was about 28, I had lost the first million and was a million dollars in debt. And so 
the first thing I needed to do was, okay, let's see, I can take up bankruptcy. No, that isn't being honest. No integrity. Not the way I'm going to do this. So I decided I needed to find a way to uh, pay that million dollars back. And I had a, a college degree. I could make more money as a waitress uh, than I could with my college degree. I went to work as a waitress. I literally um, brought food home for my kids from the restaurant because I couldn't afford to pay for the food. I juggled money between am I losing the car or the house first and literally lost my car. Bought a car for $250 from a 16-year-old who was buying a better car. So it tells you where I was at the time. Not fun. Um, and uh, decided I needed to do something different. I couldn't work as a waitress <laughs> to try and pay this debt. So I applied for at the University of Utah for a master's degree in speech pathology and audiology. And when I uh, was accepted, I suddenly had the realization that I needed someone to take care of sick children. I was working nights as a waitress and going to school in the day, and I needed someone to take care of my children. So I started calling nanny agencies, and um, every one of them would answer me with, this is what we do for you. And I'd say, no, that's not what I want. First of all, I have six kids. Half of them would hang up on me. Uh, the other ones would say, but I'm sorry, this is what we do. But I don't need that. I was so frustrated that um, I put a phone in my youngest child's bedroom. Oops. I'm not keeping up. Sorry. This is at the time that I had to start supporting my family. I put a, a dial phone in my youngest child's bedroom and put an ad in Washington, D.C. for families and an ad in Wyoming for nannies. And I literally had a manual typewriter that I'd type up the application. I'd run to the library with six kids in the car and make copies and run to FedEx to get the application sent to a family. And uh, because I did things differently, the largest nanny agency was here in Utah. And I thought, I can't, I'm not prepared to go up against them. So I'm going to do things differently. And I started doing things a little differently than they did. Within the first year, I became the largest nanny agency in the U.S. Um, that was while I was working and going to graduate school. It was all about a need, and I filled that need. I listened to families when they called, and when they told me these are the things they looked for, then I would match them up with a nanny that was willing to do the things they were looking for. I filled the need that wasn't there in the first place. Um, with this, I was able to pay back my debt very quickly and become very successful. I'd been running the nanny agency for a while when in a Time magazine there was a little one-line thing that said the U.S. government is opening up a trial program for bringing au pairs over from other countries into the U.S. to do child care. I researched it, uh, found out what I needed to do, and what I had to do took about two years. And This was a three-year trial to get a 501c set up and all the different regulations that I needed to have. And when the U.S. government opened it up to people to apply, I applied. They chose five agencies, and I was one of them. I came from this industry differently. All the rest of the agencies were um, cultural exchange programs. And they thought, well, this is great. We can just take this application, this family, and put them together, and there you go, just like we do with uh, <coughs> cultural exchange. It doesn't work that way when you're dealing with your own children. You want to be matched up with someone you can live with, someone that has the experience. But these agencies didn't realize that. So after a lot of false starts with the, the government and it not working, they came to me and said, would you write some of the regulations for the U.S. government au pair program? Because we're not obviously not doing it right, and we need to know what is required to get a good child care provider. I found myself suddenly having the world opened, and I had to go to every country in the, in the world and open up an agency. And that was a privilege beyond belief because of the opportunity to meet every culture, different people, um, different countries. It, it's an experience of a lifetime to be able to do that. I also had to have agents here in the U.S. within 60 miles of any au pair that I placed in the U.S. And so I had a, a, about 400 employees in an, inside and outside of the country. And was very successful for this. I did it. Uh, I, I worked 
um, in speech pathology at first for a while, and then granted at night, I had to open up my basement and uh, have a the office in the basement, hired employees, and it became a a very successful company. This was the Au Pair company. It's still in in existence now. I sold it in 2004. I saw the, the industry changing, and the demand was not there. The economy was starting to change, and people could not afford Au Pairs. So I sold it at the height. It's about it's still running today, but it's about half what it was when I sold it, which is a very another very important thing entrepreneurs need to know. Every business has a cycle. You have to watch that cycle. I didn't with real estate. I didn't see it coming or was not smart enough to realize it was coming. And you need to follow that with your businesses. You want to make sure that if you do sell something or if you do see it going down, sell it before it goes down. Try and get maximize the benefit of it in a sale when it's at the prime. And also another caveat for entrepreneurs, do not, do not sell your own company. You are too emotionally attached. Someone comes in and goes, but this is bad. You're ready to kick them out, even though they're going to hand you the money. Make sure you get a broker, and they know what they're doing. They know how to negotiate for you. You'll get a much better price. You'll get a much better relationship with that buyer that you're going to have to have to teach them what you're doing than if you do it yourself. So just remember, when you get ready to sell your business, please do not sell it yourself. Um, I've been running the au pair business about 13 years when my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, I wanted to do something for him, and I researched everything I could find to see if there was anything we could do for Parkinson. And I found one remote article about how growth hormone could help. I looked all over the country, and at the time there was one doctor doing it as a, a research study. And so I flew down to Palm Springs, California, and met with him, told him about my dad, and we did testing, and the Parkinson had progressed too far, and so my dad could not be helped. But because Parkinson's is a familial disease, I figured that I might have the potential of, of getting it. So I went on this program, and the program was bioidentical hormones and uh, with growth hormone and other, and other things, supplements. And so I started on this program. Uh, it was very expensive. It was about $2,000 a month, and... He had no service, none whatsoever. He didn't have a lab. He didn't have a pharmacy. He didn't know what he was doing in his office. It was just chaos. And finally, even though I felt tremendously better, I called him up and said, I'm sorry, I can't deal with this. This is ridiculous. I'm quitting your program. And I think in his frustration, he snapped back at me and said, well, do you think you could do better? And I went, of course I can. I knew nothing about medicine, uh, but... It didn't matter. I, I could do it. I was already dealing with high-end families in the au pair industry. I knew their demands. I knew what, how you had to treat them, how you had to have the best service for them. And so I thought, well, I can learn the medical. I can do something with that. I know how to do customer service. So we talked for a few, few uh, months, and then he called me up one night, and he said, Jackie, I'm ready. Can you start a, a lab for me? I said, sure, no problem. He said, how about tomorrow? Uh, Sure, no problem. I don't know what to think about a lab, but I'll do it. Uh, the next day, he sent me 1,700 files. Obviously, I did not have the time to go out and learn how to run a rat lab, learn how to set one up. It was impossible. So I learned my next really important lesson, and that is you hire the best. So I went out and I hired the best person in a lab. We were able to set one up very quickly because I didn't have the a period of time of learning. In fact, I could never have learned in time to get this up, but I hired the best and we had the lab up and running. These 1,700 patients were so thrilled that they finally were getting customer service. They were finally getting results that actually were legitimate. And uh, so they said they gave, gave the doctor feedback about how great it was. And within a couple of months, he said, okay, I'm ready. You can start a pharmacy. And I said, absolutely. This time, I went out and I wrote letters to every pharmacy in Utah. I said, I need either to buy your pharmacy, to joint venture with you, or to just send the prescriptions with you. And I talked to a few of them. None of them worked out. And I was just about ready to give up when uh, two pharmacists called me and said, can you come and talk? And they owned Salt Lake Drug. It was a very, um, it had been around for a long time. 
and very well known. I went in there and they said, we want to come work for you. I said, well, no, I'll, I'll buy your pharmacy. And they said, no, pharmacy isn't worth anything. We just want to come work for you. We can give you maybe two or three years. They were in their late 60s. And they said, we'll give you a couple of years and, and then we're going to retire. And I said, okay. So we went back. Um, we had no formulas. We had no idea how to deliver the hormones to the patients. And so these pharmacists, being older, had actually compounded before. Compounding was the way pharmacies used to be in the, um, well, forever up until the 40s when the big pharma companies came in. And so they knew how to compound. And we would sit there and try trial and error until we got a formula that worked, until we got a delivery system that worked. Um, and I became their first technician. And they told me what to do. And one time I even got kicked out of my own pharmacy because I did something wrong. So <laughs> be careful when you hire the best. They'll also tell you what to do. Um, the company we started was called MedQuest Pharmacy. It's now under an umbrella of Innovations Group, and we have seven subsidiaries underneath that, the Innovations Group Corporation. The first place I had my au pair business in Union Park. I don't know if you're familiar with Midville. But there's a lot of glass buildings in this park, and I had my au pair business in there, and I thought, well, I need something close by, so I was going to rent the space next to it, but the pharmacy has to have be certified and regulated. So there was one built one place in the entire complex that was registered for a pharmacy, and it was 600 square feet. And it was on the second floor. I thought, Great, we'll take it. Well, then I found out that the regulations require that you have an ADA bathroom in your pharmacy, and so we had to shut down the entire building, uh, dig up the cement floors, hallways to get the plumbing in there. And have the bathroom. So we have the most expensive bathroom you can ever imagine in a 600 square foot place. And 300 of that is a bathroom. <laughs> it was a little different than what we had planned on, but, um, it worked. Um, we became the experts in the field and have from day one been profitable. I did not have to do any marketing. I was the only one in the industry at the time and word of mouth grew so quickly that we never had to market. We were running as fast as we could to get uh, the business we had done. Again, business can't stay the same. And so as the need grew, we decided we needed to add more things to our, to our business. We decided we needed supplements, and we wanted the best quality of supplement, and we wanted it in the most therapeutic dose that it needed to be in. And so we started a supplement manufacturing plant. It could not obviously be in Union Park with the high rent business area. So we looked all over Salt Lake for the uh, building that was big enough to put both of the businesses in together. We prided ourselves on buying the ugliest building in Utah. <laughs> it was the only one we could find. It was on 123rd South. And if you're familiar in Draper, that is where there is a huge mall there now. Uh, we were fortunate we bought this building and we owned the only piece of land in that entire place that was holding up the entire mall. Uh, I was there about two weeks when the developers came and said, we need your property. And I said, uh-uh, we just moved in. I'm sorry, we're staying here. They came back so many times and kept doubling and quadrupling the price to a point that we decided we would gladly move. <laughs> this was the building. Um, and found our, our most recent building in North Salt Lake. It's a 40,000 square foot facility. We um, have acreage behind and we're breaking ground soon to build another 40,000 square foot facility behind us. We do about um, 5,000 scripts a day. And that doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that every one of them are handmade. We make them specific to each prescription and each prescription is written specific to an individual's body. So everything we make is different. And we, we send out about 5,000 prescriptions a day through this facility. We are, um, we have been in business now 15 years with the pharmacy. We're celebrating our 15th year and our revenue is about 28,000, 28 million right now. We have business in line once we get this building built that we will, we figure within the next year to year and a half, we will be at 75 million. So our growth rate is very, very um, strong. As we were uh, doing the supplements, we realized also that 
his physicians, we were in a new field of medicine, they didn't know how to practice it. So we started a CME accredited seminar company that does seminars to teach physicians how to do this type of medicine. And after we got that up and running, we also realized that there are no software programs that fit this industry. So we hired again the best after uh, several fault starts. We went to India and that didn't work. We went to Canada and that didn't work. And we ended up hiring the person that had started with me at Au Pair who was or at the nanny agency, who was 18 at the time and was brilliant, we rehired him, and he has developed a software system, a C CRM, uh, electronic health records, and an electronic medical record system that can go into a physician's office. He can see all of the lab results. Everything is done electronically to into our pharmacy, so a human being doesn't touch that prescription until it goes into the pharmacy to actually be filled. So we cut out all of the customer service People that you would normally have to have to take that the prescription from that many people, it is through our system and, and electronically done. Um, one of the things I learned when I started this company, we had 100% of our business was from one doctor, and we slowly added on new doctors. But it, at the point, we were about 90% of our business was one doctor, and he called me one day and he said. I found growth hormone at a better price. And I said, that's great. He said, um, it'll be coming to you tomorrow and you're supposed to use it and just cut it by a hundred and send it out. And I said, okay. The, the bottle came and it come from somewhere in Europe. I can't remember offhand where it was. Madagascar. It came from Madagascar. The plain bottle got this big, had things floating in it. It had things growing in it. And I called him up and I said, no, I can't use this. I don't even know what it is. And it, there's something in it. He said, yes, you can use it. And you will use it. And I said, no, I won't. He said, if you don't use it tomorrow, I will cancel every script that I've written. A, visit, a patient cannot use your pharmacy again. So I called in, I think at the time, our seven employees. And we sat down at a table and I looked at him and I said, okay, here's our option. We can use this. We don't know what it is. We don't know if we're going to hurt patients. Uh, and we'll be in business. We can not use it. And every one of us is going to look for another job. They did not have one person that even hesitated. Everyone said, we're not using this. And so next morning when the doctor called, I said, I'm sorry, we're not using it. And he said, then you can consider all the prescriptions canceled. I said, okay. Um, patients started calling and asking for their prescriptions to be filled. And we would tell them, I'm sorry, the doctor's canceled the prescription. You're going to have to call him, and he will tell you what pharmacy to go to. Well, by noon, 70% of those patients had called to ask what new doctor I could give them that they could use our pharmacy. And by 4 o'clock that afternoon, the doctor had called back and reinstated all the prescriptions. Now, it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes using the high road, you don't get rewarded so immediately. But... In that case, it was so black and white. We gave the customers what they wanted. They wanted to stay with us rather than the doctor. So don't ever deviate. Don't ever um, quality or on honesty or integrity. You'll never ever. In um, you know what the next? Okay, these are the companies that we have that are all related to MedQuest Pharmacy. They're. Um, it's a vertical integration, so we have everything. We call ourselves a one-stop shop. A doctor will come to us and can get everything from plans to set up his office, training on his staff, uh, ability to do labs and pharmacy and supplements through the Internet, through our software system, and how we can read everything. It has, uh, he doesn't have any, have to have any papers. It will charge the patients. It will um, keep the records electronically. So everything is done to the physician if he comes through us and does Everything we have. Uh, wrong one. Okay. In the early 2000s, I again realized that real estate was starting to go up again. And this time I was smarter and I knew what I was doing. And I thought, oh, it was a disaster the first time. Do I dare do it again? And I decided, yes, I did because I knew how to do it this time. I first of all hired the best realtor. Then I hired the best mortgage broker, the best title company and a desk uh, contractor. And we had things set up so that if it was going to be a high-end house, he had this finished. If it was going to be 
a rental, it was this finished. If it was going to be a flip, it was this finished. I knew exactly how to go in and, and renovate a property. I, the realtor would bring me properties at first and I'd go see them, we'd buy them, go through the whole process. And the market was moving so quickly at the time that it got to be that I never saw the properties. The realtor would buy them. I'd go in, sign the paperwork, go back uh, three or four weeks later, sign it again because we'd already sold it. And uh, just phenomenal that the turnover of, of the real estate that we bought, I couldn't buy it fast enough. And because I had the best where properties were having 10 offers on, ours got through because I had the best realtor. I knew that I could get mortgages and, and it worked well because I had hired the best again. And this time I knew what I was doing. I also knew what I was doing to watch for the market as it slowed and peaked and was about to crash, which we've seen and was able to sell the property. I still have a lot of rental property, but I keep it as um, it's cash flow positive. I don't need to worry about it. I have a co several companies that manage the properties, and I make very good money on it. But I was smart enough to learn from my first mistake on how to make it work out. In uh, 2004, I thought, I, I am just too crazy with all these businesses. I need to get rid of the old business, and I did sell it. and. Uh, found out I didn't have any more time than I had before. It's still, the company still took over all of my time. Currently, um, MedQuest and its subsidiaries are growing very, very quickly. I have, uh, in the last month, stepped down as CEO. I'm chairman of the board and I have uh, a CEO taking over, which has freed me to be able to do more of the development, uh, new businesses, new Ideas. We're going into a lot of different areas that we haven't had time to do before that are really exciting to me. That's what I like the best is the startup. Running the business is okay, but the excitement is in the startup to take an idea, one idea, and create something that's never been created before, or then you can do it better than someone else. And that's where the real, real fun is for me. So it's now giving me time to do the things that I like to do as far as starting new things. Employees are the lifeblood of your, your business. You cannot do everything yourself. And most entrepreneurs have a really hard time letting go of that baby that they have to trust someone else to do what they, they have been created. Remember to, your employees are the best thing that you have. And I've been really fortunate. I have wonderful employees that work really hard and have the same ethics I have. It's been a real fun opportunity. So, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, what is the next step? The entrepreneurial spirit is to go forward. Timing and desire are really important. You have to look at the economy, look at what is out there, what is growing, what isn't. I know a lot of things, and I'm totally un-IT savvy, so I know nothing. But um, that's where a lot of the industries are going to. You're seeing a lot of the startup companies are something to do with technology. Um my philosophy has always been not to borrow money. From day one, I have not borrowed a cent, and our companies are debt-free right now. So the economy, no matter whether it goes up or down, will not hurt us. There's a lot of other theories of, of borrowing venture capital or, or PE companies coming in and owning part of your company to give you more equity to money to grow faster, but you have to give up a lot of equity. So you have to balance that, whether you want to grow faster We've had the opportunity and made enough money that we can grow as fast as we want because we use internal money. That, again, is up to you, but be careful. Uh, VCs and PEs really do take a lot of your company and, and their high interest rates. So only if you're really sure this is going to grow and you're willing to give up part of, of what you're making would you want to consider that. Each company starts with a need. And um, starting and, and running companies is really an exciting trip, I hope. All of you will have the opportunity to do that. All I can tell you is dream big and then go with what you really feel. Go with your gut feeling because it will usually pay off for you. As Dr. Glasser said two years ago, I was honored as Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young, and the opportunity was amazing. I went to the finals in California for the United States where I had the opportunity of meeting three or four hundred other entrepreneurs and their stories and the companies that they developed were amazing. And I talk to students and hear about the companies and ideas that they're coming with 
coming up with, and it is really, really exciting. There's still so many things that can be developed and, and run. You have just huge opportunities before you. All of my successes with business would mean nothing without my family. Um, I think you have to go away from this lecture knowing that entrepreneurs can get really consumed with what they're doing. And it can take over your whole life and you're doing nothing from morning till night if you even go to bed because you get so involved. You have to keep your priorities straight. I'm uh, fortunate because I have a husband who is an entrepreneur himself. So when I don't make it home for dinner, he's not upset. Or when he doesn't make it home for dinner, I'm not upset. But we uh, are able to realize the the time constraints that it takes to, to start a new company. I'm uh, really fortunate I have six wonderful children and 16 grandchildren, so it's really exciting. Um, a, uh, being an entrepreneur allows me to be able to go to their programs, to do what I want to, to be with them when they need to have special things that if you're running, if you're working a regular 8 to 5 job, you, you can't, you don't have the opportunity to do that. And being an entrepreneur allows you to do that. We've been really fortunate and done extremely well with the company. And so we've decided we want to give back to the, to those that have helped us. And we've decided that most of the contributions and things that we do are related to children. And we sponsor a lot of people, a lot of children in Appalachian Mountain. Amazingly, but in the United States, we have a lot of children going hungry. And in the Appalachian Mountains, there are a lot of children that don't get the opportunity to go to school because they don't have clothing, they don't have shoes, they don't have food. And so we donate to a company there that takes care of children in the Appalachian Mountains. And then one year we were uh, on a tour to Guatemala, and we had this big bus and these Americans with enough junk food to uh, provide for the third world. <laughs> and we stopped at a, a little school, and the school was was developed by an American who was trying to take the Mayan children who in Guatemala, the Mayans are considered the, the lowest class of people, teach them English, teach, give them an education, and give them a chance to get out of the cycle of poverty. These children were in these cute little uniforms and were darling, and I, I happened to go up to the, the person that started it and said, oh, this is so great. They're so cute. Are they learning well? And she said, yeah, and she broke down in tears, and she said, but they come to school in the morning without any food, and they stay here all day without any food, and they go home, and hopefully they have a tortilla when they go home. And here we are with all this junk food in our in our bus, and we decided at that point that we were going to do something. So we provide meals for the children in the school, and we are now providing the tuition for more and more children to come. We also have been helping to build some of them houses. They have they live in a one room house with a dirt floor, no plumbing, no running water. And so we're trying to, to change things a little bit because we've been so fortunate. And this is uh, some pictures of the students, some of the kids at the school. If you have an idea, do something with it. Don't sit on it. Someone else, I guarantee, will develop your idea and who knows, maybe make a fortune with it. Um, I honestly love getting up in the morning. It is exciting for me to go to work. It is exciting for me to see how we are literally changing how people age. Worldwide, we are changing how people age. That is a really exciting, fun opportunity for us. We have patients that call us all the time thanking us in tears for changing their life, for helping them to be able to age differently than their parents are, for keeping people out of rest homes, keeping them out of the final months of their life in a hospital, not knowing who they are or where they are. I watched that with my father. It was the most heart-wrenching situation you could ever imagine to see a brilliant man lose the ability to think, to talk, to walk, to lose all bodily functions, to be able to have to be fed. And so we're changing the way people age. Um, I have a quote that I think really sums up everything we've talked about tonight. The Dalai Lama, when asked what surprises him most about humanity, answered, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health, and then he's so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present, the results being he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die, 
and then you guys having never really lived. You students have the opportunity to really live. You have the ability, you've got the education, and if you've got the desire, you can go out and do anything you want in this world and create anything you want. And I hope all of you will do it. <laughs> Thank you.